afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mark Vollmer here, Superintendent of Minor Public Schools. I just want to take this opportunity to uh, thank you for your willingness to take part in our uh, our meeting, our virtual meeting this afternoon. I uh, kind of want to lay out a little bit of background of where we're at, talk about the committee itself, uh, and also why uh, um, how you can get your, your questions answered. Uh, parents and staff members in the initial communication you got from the school district, there was a link uh, to where you could post questions. And those questions are going to be going to our moderator. And when we get to the point, uh, they will be bringing those questions down to me. Now, I, I do want you to understand that at, at our noon presentation, we had about 450 people on and we had over 300 questions. And we're not going to have enough time to get through all of those questions. So our moderators are going to be working on uh, maybe combining those a little bit and, and trying to uh, get all of those together in a way that we can answer and get people uh, the information that they need. Uh, the next thing is, is that these are gonna be going into a, a Q and A, which we'll be putting together and getting that information out there so everybody can have the opportunity to to review them at a later date and, and have a better idea about the specifics of, of uh, what was talked about and, and the answers that were given. Um, so we're going to begin here. Um, one thing I do want to say uh, before we begin is that in the uncertainty of everything we're dealing with right now, matter of fact, we joke in a, in a way that the only certain thing is uncertainty, that we, we have a lot of people that are very passionate, passionate about that everyone should wear masks or people shouldn't wear masks or we should be in school, we should not be in school. And I'm going to ask a favor as we go through. And that favor is, is that while passion is not a bad thing, we also need to remember compassion during this process. We need to remember that people are coming to us and they have differing ideas and, and differing attitudes. And we want to do whatever we can to make sure that we listen and that we take into consideration um, that which others have to offer. So this has not been an easy process. We've been working on this for quite some while, quite a while here. As a matter of fact, here is our reintegration committee. Uh, we had a lot of different people working on this. Uh, myself with Assistant Superintendents Lawson and Slotsby. Uh, Cheryl Hager uh, as our title coordinator. A lot of services provided through title programs. Thanks to Cheryl and her excellent uh, crew that works with kids. Uh, Tara Jordan, our ELA coordinator. Megan Strange, who's an assistant principal at two of our larger elementary schools. Corey Thorson, who's principal of Bel Air. Rhonda Grindy, math coordinator. We've got excellent guidance and advice from Lisa Clute, uh, First District Health, as well as uh, Lisa Westman uh, and uh, Angie Eisenzimmer, all from First District Health, that were providing uh, knowledge and assistance to us as we went through this. Uh, Heather Opland, our special ed director, has been integral in this part, as well as Raquel Labatti. Uh, she is our uh, school liaison officer out at Minot Air Force Base. We were also joined by Colonel Thomas uh, uh, in the uh, health department as well as Captain Young uh, with the Air Force. So we had a lot of guidance there. Uh, NEA President Sarah Hicks was a part of our uh, meetings and appreciated her input uh, and recommendations from teachers uh, as well as all of our coordinators uh, that provided great insight into that as well. Ms. Lundy, our athletic director, uh, had a huge part in this. Katie Dahl in HR. Uh, and we just had a great group that really worked hard and had a lot of very detailed discussion about <clears throat> where this plan is and where this plan needs to go. And, and I do want to say that as we look at this plan today, please understand this is a 30,000 foot view. This is this is the macro look at things. And a lot of the questions that we got last time, while they were really, really good questions, are the micro work that needs to be done, uh, personalizing these plans uh, individually um, by schools. And uh, that's done for a lot of reasons. For example, you know, lunch protocols will change in consideration of the building. Where is lunch served? How big is the lunchroom? How many kids go through the lunchroom in a given period of time? So a lot of things that go into consideration. So this plan is a long ways from being done. It's 
plan is kind of the guide overall guidance of, of where we need to be. Uh, this process actually began, you could trace it all the way back to March when Governor Burgum ordered that all schools were to be closed. Uh, but after school was out and we were able to have a very successful dis, uh, socially distanced graduation, we began initial meetings at the beginning of June. Uh, we also, in June, had parent focus groups and teacher focus groups uh, talking about how distance learning went, what could we do better, uh, what went well, and what, what can we do to make this a better experience uh, in the event we would end back up uh, into a, a different model of education rather than the traditional model that we're used to. And I have to be honest with all of you didn't think for a second in June that we would be where we're at today. I really felt that the way numbers were trending, that we would be in blue and that things would be good to go and we wouldn't have to worry about any of this. But again, now we're forced with some very uh, difficult decisions. Uh, in July 14th, Governor Bergen released his North Dakota Smart Restart Guidelines. Our committee went to work shortly thereafter, uh, presented to the school board. We released a parent and staff survey. We've continued that work uh, up to our release on Monday, uh, review by principals yesterday, and now these virtual meetings today uh, to give you an opportunity to, to provide input and to ask questions. And again, that link for uh, asking those questions uh, was in the initial communication that you had received from the district. Uh, we have a school board meeting tomorrow and we'll be hope asking them to pass um, this or approve this uh, plan or, or either as is or amended uh, and that will have yet yet to come uh, as we go. So again, just a great um, <clears throat> opportunity and uh, so appreciative of everything that that you have done here to make it here today. So uh, we began by, first of all, like good PLC groups do, we created uh, our goals and we had four very simple but very important goals. First of all, our goal was to mitigate virus spread in a congregate setting. Um, schools are congregate settings. We have a lot of people in, in small quarters and uh, we have to be very careful to do everything we can to mitigate that virus spread. Uh, next, to plan for staff, student, and community health and safety. Uh, we really have tried to look at this not just as a community uh, or a, a school issue, but as a community issue. How do we keep our community safe? Um, our kids and our staff and our families, they go home to uh, other communities, and uh, we just want to do everything within our power to make sure that we, we keep that environment as safe as possible. Next, to inspire stakeholder confidence. Uh, we know that when we left last spring, um, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, and we want to do everything we can to ensure all stakeholders that uh, we're moving in the right direction and doing uh, what we need to do to keep people safe uh, and that people have a clear understanding of where we're at with all of that. Lastly, to ensure academic growth. Uh, this is our, our building. Uh, our district. These are our kids. We want to do uh, everything that we can within our power to ensure that learning is paramount in moving this forward and we don't forget those goals. Of those committee members that worked on all of this, we divided essentially into three groups. The health and safety plan uh, was under the direction of Assistant Superintendent Slotsby. Uh, and uh, the information of who all was considered in this uh, is listed below. So when we talk about the importance of a safety and health plan, the goal was, you know, how do we look at our facilities? How do we keep them safe? How do we address transportation, food service, health services, budget? And how do we care for people? How do we help our people stay whole and and well and good. The distance learning plan, which we refer into here, and we have a little more work to do yet, uh, is uh, under the lead of Superintendent Lawson, and that involves curriculum technology, professional learning to help teachers with any skills that they might need if we go to a distance learning model, uh, and how do we support students and teachers and our mental health. That's all a very um, big part of all of this. Lastly is communications, and that falls under my purview. That's uh, work with students and parents, teacher, staff, district, and health uh, organizations. I work very closely 
uh, with First District Health, with Superintendent Basler, to make sure that we are current in all of the information and uh, that we make the best decision we can, giving the information that we have. So what this all really boils down to is the state model uh, for for uh, infection rates, uh, and it's a tiered model, it's a colored model. Um, right now, North Dakota, as determined by the North Dakota Department of Health, is in green. Uh, there are, are essentially five different colors, from blue being the least restrictive, can do whatever we want to do, the new normal, we call it, to red being very, very restrictive. So as of right now, we as a state are listed in the green category. If we get to yellow, yellow is the area where we start seeing more concern about transmission of the virus. Uh, and we start amping up safety concerns. That would be at the point where the district would begin the process of moving to a hybrid model, bringing only half of our kids in at a time. And when we get down to orange and red, that's where we have significant transmission with a high degree of uh, risk and exposure. That's where we get down into a distance learning model. So a lot of people ask me, Last spring, why were we not in school when we only had five or six cases in Ward County uh, and relatively few in the state? And the answer to that was the emphasis on that time was on social distancing. And I think there's a lot of people out there um, that would be able to uh, that would be able to tell you that when we really focus on social distancing, we were able to keep the transmission of COVID. Uh, relatively low, but unfortunately, um, we've seen an uptick in, in cases in parts of the state. But as long as uh, we continue, I just want everybody to know that that color structure is important. And as we move through the presentation today, um, we'll talk more specifically about what those colors mean in regard to um, what this is for our upcoming school year. Uh, we have a lot of questions that happens in regard to what would happen if we saw an increased case in in Ward County. And we've had some frustrations. Uh, we have to get kind of to the bottom of where all of that is at. One of the frustrations that we have had is that the information that comes to us from the Department of Health is based on the number of positive cases in Ward County. Now, we don't necessarily know where that. I want to bring that up is because this is not just a decision that I will make. This will be made in conjunction with First District Health Unit uh, and with the principal who is also serving as the building uh, COVID-19 coordinator. So we'll gather our information together and we will do our best to make the best decision at the time. So even yellow, as I said earlier, is a time that we may begin to make the transition into distance learning. Um, we um, might make that in green if there were a high rate of infections in our area. So even though the state might be green, we might make a transition, but it will be based on the science behind community spread, the science behind where our infection rates are and taking the advice of those experts. Uh, so that is the process of how that will look. Eventually, these decisions could be made school by school, depending where infection rates were. Uh, but, you know, we just want you to know that we're going to be including a lot of people in making that decision uh, for everyone involved. So what does that look like in general? I'm going to go through these very quickly uh, in blue. Blue would essentially be our new normal, which means that school would be in session and masks would be recommended but they would not be required. Um, in green, we're going to still be in session. That would be the plan with enhanced cleaning uh, and sanitizing procedures in place for all of our buildings, social distancing where possible, masks required in hallways, common areas and when entering the building, and in, in general, masks are required, okay? Now, there's some confusion about that and smaller class sizes in the back tabs in the matrix towards the end, uh, then a mask. There will be definite mask breaks, okay? And that would mean that, you know, we can't expect people to wear a mask all the time. There would be an opportunity for wearing masks uh, or taking breaks. And I also want to clarify 
that when we talk about masks, what we're essentially talking is a covering of the face. So we've had questions, could I wear a face shield? Could I wear some other type of a mask that would allow, you know, me to see through um, and, and see someone's lips moving? And, and the answer to that is absolutely. Um, we also know that we have some kids that might have an aversion to wearing masks. It might be a medical uh, reason. Uh, whatever, we will work with families to help find them a type of mask or face shield uh, that will work uh, to the best of our ability. In yellow is where we would begin to make that transition to the hybrid model. It doesn't mean that once we hit yellow, we automatically go. We will still use that same um, Venn diagram that we looked at just a couple of minutes ago and get those parties together, we'll make those decisions based on the data that we have uh, and the facts that surround COVID infections in our community. The difference between green and yellow is that we will work our way to that hybrid model. We'll have only half of the kids uh, in session at a time. That makes social distancing a requirement because we it's easier at that point. We have less kids and, and masks are definitely going to be a requirement and also required on all of our district buses, as well as they are on green. But the difference is with busing, in yellow, we'll only be having half capacity on buses, uh, and again, only educating half of our kids at any given time. In orange is where we really get very concerned about potential spread in our community. That's where we begin the transition to our distance learning model. This could mean this will mean there will be no district transportation at that point, very limited access to school buildings, and masks will be required anytime anyone is in the school. And in red, of course, we're in distance learning and schools are closed to the public and only essential personnel will be allowed to be in our schools. When we talk about the hybrid model, essentially what we talk about is dividing the alphabet into group A and group B and we would look at bringing kids in on alternating days. The example I have here shows that a student would be in on first week. They'd be in session for three days out of the week and online for two days. The next week would be the exact opposite. Group A and Group E would rotate and that would just continue. The advantage of a model like this is it would allow uh, staff and students more of an opportunity to to learn from a lesson, to dig in, to come back the next day, to maybe do some lab work, something that supports an in-class learning, and the third day that would help move them towards um, would help move them towards an option for advanced learning or preparing them for their days where they'll be at home distance learning. That would be one option we have considered. The other would be very similar to the option we used in summer school this summer. And that option is um, a rotation of day on, day off, with every Friday being a day where where staff um, would have the opportunity to do very specific um, interventions. Um, so we have some options there, and we haven't locked into anything yet, uh, because as we move forward, uh, and we look at the status we have today, uh, it is our recommendation to delay the start of this school year until August 27th. Staff will still report as they were scheduled to on the 18th, and this additional time is going to allow us to help prepare for everything that we need to work on uh, in order to be prepared for those families that choose the distance learning model. Uh, and for those that plan to be in person this fall. Classified staff will be notified of when and where to report. Um, again, we intend to start in person on the 27th, okay? And that is going to be um, based on what family decisions are. They will have an opportunity uh, to consider the distance learning model uh, as well. Now, a couple of things about the distance learning model. It will look very different than um, what we we saw last spring last spring we had a very um, um emergency type of distance learning we had limited access to online lessons the the activities in distance learning from this point on are going to parallel what's going on in the classroom uh, and it's going to be an expectation that all students will be online uh, to make this happen and of course if they can't be online they don't have internet access uh, we will 
ask them to contact their school principal, uh, we may have ways of helping with that. We will be asking our parents to commit to a nine week period of time for the distance learning model. Uh, it is going to be uh, a nine week commitment. You'll have the opportunity to come back in person after those nine weeks, or you could continue to do the distance learning. Uh, but we do ask for a commitment of that. And we're gonna ask that that take place uh, for everyone. Uh, and we and that, that you declare by April, or excuse me, April, I can't figure that out, August 11th, okay, will be the date to do that. That's gonna give us an opportunity um, to determine what we can do as far as staffing to meet the needs of students who are distance learning and who are going to be in class. The one thing is our teachers will not be doing both. Um, that That's not the expectation of teachers. We can't expect teachers to stand and deliver to some of their students and be in line with others. Uh, so there might be some potential reassignment of teaching staff uh, and we'll work on that uh, simply as we as we go through. So as, if you're thinking distance learning and you want to know more about it, there will be more information coming. Uh, I will tell you that um, that turnaround time is going to be relatively quick, but we do not want you to notify your principal yet that you're going to be distance learning. There will be a form. Uh, if the board approves this plan, there will be a form that will be released on Friday, and that will be the form that you will need to submit uh, to notify us of your intention. And at noon, we did have several people that asked some pretty specific questions about what did, does it have to be a whole family that chooses to distance learn? Could it be uh, one kid distance learns and the other child goes to school? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. We're very flexible on that. Uh, you're not declaring for your family. You'll declare for individual kids. And the assumption will be if you do not fill out the distance learning form that you will be coming in person. Um, so we'll get more information on that after the board meeting, okay? So parents may opt for that distance learning. Um, we'll get that squared away. We also know that students uh, who are, are asking the students who attend school in person provide their own mask. Uh, mask requirements are outlined in the plan. Um, subject area by subject area there's been a couple of corrections in there that have been changed out um, but blue recommended and in green going to be required but there will be opportunities for mask breaks and the more restrictive the plan gets the more res more requirement for mask wearing uh, will happen but it is very detailed uh, and delineated in the plan. Uh, this is a 30,000 foot view of our plan. Uh, I've already got a list of questions here and we're going to uh, go ahead and begin with that. I know uh, in 20 minutes it doesn't do justice to go over to a plan that detailed, uh, but we'll go ahead and we'll uh, ask these questions the best that we can, answer these questions the best that we can. Uh, they will put to get, be put together in a uh, uh, consolidated document um, as soon as we can get that together and that will be available for all parents. So if I don't read your question exactly today, uh, please know that it might have been combined together uh, with some other questions and we'll do the best um, that we can. So okay, first question, will uh, PACE, our gifted and talented program, will that be canceled? Uh, we're currently meeting with that staff right now uh, to determine uh, what PACE will look like. There will be gifted and talented options for those students. Uh, it, what it will look like has yet to be determined and you'll be contacted if you're a parent of a PACE student, uh, you'll be contacted very soon. Uh, next question is, will kindergarten orientation still take place? The answer to that, absolutely. Uh, we've got a team working on, once the board approves our late start, uh, we'll go ahead and um, <clears throat> um, We'll go ahead and be able to um, to get that information out and get that scheduled. Um, part of our late start plan is in the elementary as well is uh, open houses that are spread out over a period of time in our social distance. So we'll have a good uh, opportunity for you to get more information on that in the next coming days. Uh, somebody asked, will high-risk teachers be allowed to require masks in their classroom? And the answer to that is yes. I think if we have one opportunity here, it's an opportunity for education. 
and we need to remind everyone that you know there's reasons why we do what we do and the primary reason is we want to keep people safe so our emphasis really needs to string down to our goal of keeping people safe so if we have a, a staff member uh, that is at high risk or we have a student who is at high risk then we're wearing those masks uh, and we would have to plan any mask breaks around uh, in a way that would not affect the safety of that individual. Uh, next question: Can I switch? Uh, can I switch to hybrid schedule only, or can it be offered? Um, hybrid will be determined on infection rates in our community. It will be a transition of the school system, so we will not offer the hybrid model and the traditional model at the same time. So we will either be offering a hybrid model um, or a traditional model. Right now, the proposal is we start in the traditional model. Families have the opportunity to do the distance learning. Um, if we would go into yellow, we would begin that transition into the hybrid model, but that would not mean we would have traditional everyday education for students until we made a transition back up to green. I hope that, I know that's kind of confusing, but um, just to clarify, the um, hybrid model is there is no everybody going to school every day. It would be the alternating days. Um, would you ever consider uh, at home for middle school and high school where socially distancing is near impossible? Um, we have had a lot of discussion about that. Uh, students will have the distance learning option uh, if they're not comfortable starting out the way, but bottom line is is the numbers the infection rates are going to be what dictates um our plans moving forward um the journey program again in gifted and talented those gifted and talented folks who are working all that out will be back in touch with you um and make that happen someone asks uh, where will kids keep the mask when not wearing them uh, we've been talking a lot about that uh, we do know we're asking people to bring their own mask. If they don't have one, we'll supply one for them, a disposable type of mask. Um, we've explored some different ideas with clips and things like that. So uh, we've got a group of people, and now when our principals are back, uh, we'll be looking. If we need to order clips for shirts and things like that, we're certainly willing to do that. Uh, what will kids do with their winter coats uh, since lockers are not available to them? Uh, in the plan, it is verified that that the secondary schools are the ones that probably would not be using the lockers. Uh, we have to work on that a little bit. We've got some time, I hope, before we have to start worrying about wearing winter coats. Uh, but we will be coming with more recommendations. As far as books and things like that, what we're finding is that every student grades five through 12 will have an, uh, a Chromebook assigned to them. And that's gonna be how they're going to be accessing the majority of their materials, which will have a, a, a different perspective on that as well. So we're not going to be expecting kids to be lugging books around all day. Um, that, uh, that will be a little bit of a different thing. But as far as winter jackets, when the time comes, we'll address that. In elementary, we're still talking access to lockers because very often they're inside the classrooms. <coughs> Excuse me. And probably a little um, um, a little more um, accessible. And the issue in secondary is that lockers tend to be congregate areas where people want to hang out at. And we want to keep those areas clear and keep people moving through hallways the best that we can. Um, um, let's see. Um, will student teachers need to make up school days? Students and teachers need to make up school days because we're delaying? No. Uh, we do a days to hour. There was a days to hour bill now. We have to meet so many hours in the semester, uh, and we will be just fine uh, with that date in August starting, and we will not need to extend into June. So. Uh, we will be fine. Question about the chart says that in green we will have smaller class sizes. That was a clerical error that will be fixed and, and um, taken into um, in for review by the board tomorrow. So that actually the smaller class sizes really fit in in the yellow category. The only smaller class sizes we'll have to work on is music and phi ed classes. Uh, at the secondary level, and it's not that students won't have the opportunity to be in those classes, 
but we might have to look at breaking up, doing sectionals and music and things like that. Um, and we will work through that. Uh, somebody wanted to know about students who are deaf or hard of hearing and uh, they rely on lip reading. Uh, we have access to masks that have uh, a clear plastic covering. We have a, a face shield, which would, um, um, we have um, face shields that will, will work for that as well, but we will work through that uh, with any of our special needs students or students that have uh, certain health concerns, for example, to make sure that we have the right kind of covering that, that works for them. Um, if you have a student that is an IEP, it's going to be, can you be on distance learning? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but that need, you need to get your IEP team together to make sure that we can get the, your child the services that uh, is, um, is necessary. So that's a big one. If you have a, a special needs child uh, or a student who is on an IEP and you're considering going to the uh, distance learning model, uh, get a hold of that uh, principal or the case manager and begin that process of getting that set up. We just want to make sure that everyone um, is um, is online. Uh, want, somebody want to know, will special ed teachers be required to serve students both in class and distance learning? That is a question that will come again um, at, uh, at that IEP process. So what services can be provided? And, and what cannot. So that will be all part of that IEP process again. Uh, okay, um, will PPE be provided for staff and students? PPE meaning, you know, any type of face shield or whatever. Uh, we are asking that parents provide um, and we're asking that staff also provide uh, primarily what we have available that staff and students are certainly able to access are disposable. Uh, that have an elastic band that hook around the ear. And uh, what we have heard from a lot of parents is their child uh, has a particular type uh, that they would prefer. Uh, and we ask that if that's the case, that they be provided. So we do ask that people provide the mask that they would prefer to use. Um, there's about a HR guidelines. Um, and again, that, you know, we're going to have you uh, talk with HR. The question is, could there be a virtual meeting? Uh, I will visit with Katie and her staff to discuss uh, some options in regard to that. Um, question says, will our colors ever differ from the state colors? And the answer to that is yes. Um, Governor Burgum has been very evident. He wants, if, if at all possible, to get to a situation where we we have our own color system by county, uh, that's a little difficult to ascertain sometimes, especially in, in rural counties um, that maybe don't have access to a large health unit um, like we do. And I just think we need to continue to work through all of those issues and see. But, you know, in conjunction with First District Health, and I'll take it back to that Venn diagram where, you know, myself and the assistant superintendents together with First District Health and the principals uh, will work together to make those calls. And, uh, you know, again, they uh, will do the best that, um, that we can. Um, when we move uh, to yellow hybrid, um, what kind of notice will families receive? Uh, we will give ample notice as much as we possibly can. Um, you know, again, if we move to the hybrid model, probably more notice than if we would have to move to distance learning. If you remember in the spring, we there was a notice that went out on us. I think it was a Sunday night and we immediately notified uh, our, our staff that indeed we were going to not be in school the next day. We want to give more uh, notice than that. Um, and we will do um, the best that we can to get you as much notice as we can. Uh, there was a question in here that somebody said CDC does not recommend face shields as substitutes for face masks. Um, and I said at noon that shields could be used as substitutes. Uh, we do have some shields that we will potentially use as, as, as substitutes, especially in special need uh, populations. So we will work through that, do the best that we can. Um, Okay, somebody says the barometer for risk is extremely close to yellow. Um, somebody is concerned that thousands of students in classrooms uh, may cause a lot of problems. 
we uh, consider that as a committee. Uh, we have weighed out a lot of research in regard to spread, uh, especially among um, younger populations. Um, at the end of the day, the committee was tasked with making some recommendations to the school board. The school board will have the final say on that. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that we have to look at that in the way of saying the advantage of all of this is that there is that distance learning option for families that are not comfortable uh, with kids being back in class right now. And that, that is flexible after a nine week period, they could come back. Um, and we'll continue to do the best we can. I just want to reiterate, none of these decisions are made in, in light. We've had a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of referral to uh, the experts. And while we can never say with 100% certainty that we're doing the right thing, I believe we're doing the best, making the best decisions we can, given the information we have right now. Uh, somebody wants to know if elementary uh, will have to wear masks in classrooms. The answer to that is yes. Uh, and as we talk more about that, I know the comment is not very clear. We'll do the best we can to clear that up. There will be mass breaks built in, though. I just can't reiterate that enough. Um, somebody asked, in elementary schools, many grades travel into math and reading groups based on their performance level within that grade. Um, you know, when the reading proposal, it, it seems like that may end. Uh, the idea behind that is, is that teachers would be more likely to move to meet with kids and kids moving to meet with a separate teacher. So. A lot of planning. Again, that depends on individual building and space, but uh, our principals are going to be working on that uh, to make that happen the best as it can. Um, is middle school following the same guidelines as sec secondary? Yes. When we talk uh, schools in Minot, we talk elementary or middle, or elementary or secondary, and, and middle as part of the secondary group. Um, um, do you believe that North Dakota Department of Health risk level for COVID-19 is reliable? I'm just going to tell you right now, they are the experts, and I think that we need to continue to take their lead on that. Um, I feel very um, positive in regard to the fact that um, Lisa Clute and the First District Health Unit do a great job of monitoring this and meet with us regularly. We are in constant communication, uh, and we have an excellent uh, group guiding us and helping us better understand all of the information uh, that comes to us. Uh, who will be running online classes if the kids opt for distance learning? Um, they, they will be, um, it will be taken care of by a certified, highly qualified minor public schools teacher. And uh, so it will not be farmed out. It will be taken care of uh, in-house by our great teachers. Um, why are there no teachers, custodians, or doctors on the committee? Um, I'm, I'm just going to address this one. Uh, first of all, you have MEA president, Sarah Hicks, longtime minor teacher on the committee. Uh, we have four coordinators who are teachers, uh, and they are on the committee. Uh, and we have, while we didn't have a doctor on the committee, we had three people from First District Health on the committee. We had two people from the health office uh, at Minot Air Force Base on the committee as well. The goal of the committee, and as we broke out into matrices and we went through all of the work, the goal was that they were to reach out to other people to get information on how we set up and how we organize and how we uh, gather information. Here is the bottom line, 1,650 employees in our district. We can't reach out to everyone. We had a large committee the way it was. I believe that we gathered information. We sought out expert advice from our buildings and grounds people, from our supply people. Some of our contacts, bus drivers, folks were, were included in this discussion. Uh, and that's a common theme. Uh, but I, I just want to say we had people that, that worked hard to get that input from as many people as, as they could. So. Um, I, I just think it would be important to maybe offer up a thanks to those people that served on that committee. Uh, they, they really did do everything they could to include um, other opinions as we went through the process. Uh, next, it says, is there a plan um, 
for custodians that are gone or sick or whatever, it's been hard to get subs. You know, we'll continue on the path. We've contracted with other service agencies in the past to do that. That's the same for everything. Bus drivers, um, you know, we'll continue uh, to, to work through that the best we can. We're also, there was a question about what about counseling session for kids? Um, we're focusing heavily on social emotional learning. Uh, not only uh, for our kids, but our staff, we all need to be well and good and whole. Uh, and that is our goal to work through that and to uh, make that happen to the best of our ability. Um, moving on, a couple more question sheets uh, just come in. Um, if Minor Public Schools moves to a hybrid model, who teaches the, ch uh, the child the online portion of his education? Is it still a classroom teacher or the different teacher in the, in the online model? You would be teaching your kids. They would have activities that they would work on on the days that they're not in school. It would not necessarily be um, it would not necessarily be um, online lessons. They would have activities. So if I were an online, if I were a hybrid teacher, I would be making the most of the days that I had that child with me in the classroom and what I would send home or what that child would work on online on the days they were not in session would be things that would support the learning we had or prepare them for upcoming learning. So it won't be a, a, a virtual component nearly as much as being on a Google Hangout with those students as work that supports the learning for the times that they are together. Uh, Again, a question, well, is this going to expand our, uh, extend the time in school in the spring and, and push us into June? The answer to that is no. Um, here it said, it stated, it, I stated at noon that temperatures would not be taken for all students and staff daily. Uh, this measure seems to be a quick check against potential infection. I, I will tell you this, we had an incredible amount of discussion in regard to this. Um, and the health experts on the committee said that while fever is an indicator of COVID, it is one of the many indicators for COVID. And um, it is not indicative of every child that has a fever or any adult that has a fever has COVID. Uh, they did not recommend the scanning. We are going to do periodic scannings or random scannings. And any visitor that comes into the office is, um, uh, any, anybody that comes in is going to have to go through that scanning process. Uh, in the document, we have very extensive information in there about what parents should be watching for. Um, if your child is exhibiting any of those symptoms, uh, especially worsening symptoms, cough, cold, fever, chills, all of that, then probably shouldn't come to school until they've consulted with somebody in the medical field. Um, and again, you know, somebody asked today, what about, you know, allergies? My child has allergies. Is he going to be sent home every day? And the answer to that is no. If he is running a fever, he might be sent home. But the general idea, and I have allergies as well. And my nose is stuffy all the time. So, um, you know, that that's not in itself a symptom of COVID or the flu or anything else. If conditions worsen, then it becomes so. We're going to ask parents to do kind of a self-guide on that as well as staff. Bottom line is if you're sick, you shouldn't be here at school. Um, if I choose in person and change my mind and go to distance learning, can you do that for the rest of the nine weeks? Uh, that is something you're going to need to work through with your principal. Um, and again, I, you know, we're going to do the best we can to do right by families. So I, I think the best thing to do would be explain to your principal what the reason is and, and work through what we can do to make that happen. Yeah. Um, somebody asked again on the masks again, we'll clean that up. So it's, it's more consistent. Uh, and I apologize for any confusion uh, in regard to that. Um, somebody said they want to do distance learning and wonder if teachers would be employees, of the district again, absolutely. Yeah. We're going to be looking at, at uh, minor public school employees that are going to be doing that instruction. Uh, question here, good question, will there be middle school sports? Uh, and the answer to that, as of right now, and again, you know, it, it's not August 27th right now, 
And so we can't tell you with all high degree of certainty, but if things were the same on August 27th as they are now, that yes, we would have middle school sports. If so, uh, however, will they be traveling on a mine it? And it would have, it would really depend how far they're traveling on a mine it. Are they traveling to a place that has COVID cases? Uh, if that be the case, the answer would probably be no. Um, and uh, we uh, would do the best that we can to, to keep everyone safe. So I would expect uh, reality is a lot more uh, in in town competitions and opportunities at the middle school level, less traveling on a mine. And I know already uh, there is very, very limited uh, <coughs> um, travel on a mine in our middle schools anyway. Uh, good question here. Who is responsible for cleaning the desks, light switches, and other surfaces every hour at the secondary level? Um, we will have cleaning supplies available in teachers' classrooms. Um, you know, I, I, my recommendation on this as an old secondary teacher, I would just recommend that it become part of your protocol. Um, students grab a paper towel. I'm going to come around, spray your desk. Please wipe it off, throw the paper towel away. Uh, you could do something like that. We will not have custodial staff to do this. The idea of it is, it's again, those high touch areas. Uh, if we can and do something like that and we have I think this is one of those situations where creativity is the key. What can you do where it doesn't become onerous? Is there any way that we could just have part of your procedure being, you know, I'm going to grab a wipe and I'm going to wipe down my desk. That's my responsibility as being a part of this class family. Um, but we're not expecting teachers to do thorough cleaning top to bottom in that five minutes between classes. Uh, whatever ownership can be given to students, especially at the secondary level, I think is important. It, it, we need to educate and we need to provide information. It's, it's part of what makes us better and, and part of what helps us deal with uh, all of the challenges we're going to be facing. Uh, will the water fountains be turned off so kids need to bring the water bottles? Yes, we are going to do that. Again, the, the idea is water fountains are, are a spreader of, of potentially of disease. So uh, we're going to do whatever we can. We just want kids to bring water bottles. That's our best option. Another question here. <clears throat> um, it says, if Minor Public Schools moves to a hybrid model, who teaches my child the online portion of his education? Um, again, it is the classroom teacher. I think I already answered this one. Yes, I apologize. I, I flipped over to the same question. Um, my apologies. So what else do we have here? Uh, if it gets bad enough, but not bad enough to close schools, how will the district handle the substitute shortage that may be inevitable? Um, again, I, I, I think that, you know, we have to look at many, many different considerations as we move this forward. And, and one of the considerations we have to take into consideration is staffing. You know, do we have people that are able to do the jobs that we do and, and how can we best uh, meet the needs of that? If, if we, you know, the, the comment, if it gets bad, but not bad enough, I just want to reassure people, we're going to have many eyes on this and continue to watch the infection rates in our community, specifically in Minot. Uh, so we know exactly, you know, what we're up against and we're going to be helping to to do contact tracing by getting information ready for state contact tracers. We're going to do the best that we can. Um, and that is our goal um, through all of this. And, you know, again, just to reiterate, we're going to do everything we can to keep people safe. And if we get to the point where it's bad, we're probably going to be making the transition to, uh, to a distance learning model. Will children go outside for recess? Yes, um, as long as the weather is is, is okay. Um, and what, one thing that we do say is that, you know, we're going to be looking probably at recess in smaller cohorts uh, again, uh, but there will be options for kids in recess. Um, if a child stays home, what interaction do they have with the teacher? Uh, we're working out the final details in the distance learning plan. I would estimate, you know, you're going to be at least probably three, maybe four hours a day online in some fashion. That may not be with a teacher at all time, but it's going to be every day you're going to be 
I and some type of a Google meet with your teacher and, and that will be an expectation. So it's not last spring. We had some of that in some cases, not a requirement. Uh, that will be an active part of the distance learning plan. We need kids to see their teachers. We need our teachers to see their kids. You can expect some small group instruction, some read, guided reading, all of that uh, done online in small groups, uh, just as it would be in the classroom, only done through a virtual model. <clears throat> Says if our family travels to Minneapolis for medical care, well, we have to quarantine when we return. Uh, I will tell you this, <coughs> that um, we have um, no requirement of that right now to my knowledge in North Dakota, but I want to be specifically clear, Minor Public Schools will not quarantine anyone. The State Department of Health quarantines, and that is oftentimes done through contact tracing. Now, Governor Burgum did have a requirement in earlier, I believe, that travel between states would result in a 14-day quarantine. Uh, but that is something coming from the state. That's not coming from us. But my understanding is that as of right now, I do not believe North Dakota requires any uh, extended quarantine for somebody coming out of state. So, uh, again, that information can be... Um, changed as as our situation changes in the state and nation but we do not quarantine that comes from the department of health okay uh superintendent basler said during a question and answer that parents can choose at any time to move to a distance learning model but parents um are, are being asked to um um to to declare and that's right okay will there be a more specific plan yes and uh, elementary principals are meeting with superintendent lawson tomorrow uh secondary principals with superintendent slotsby tomorrow on friday and there's going to be much more um coming uh with that as time goes on um a lot of questions about libraries and desks and how often will they be cleaned um talked at the beginning this is the macro plan those micro plans are going to be now be continued to uh, be developed. Um, I would anticipate, you know, we should have a quick wipe down of hard surfaces, if at all possible, um, at the beginning of every class hour. Um, but that's how, how that process will go, uh, really yet to be determined. Um, someone asked, in one place, the plan that states that students should share pencils, markers, et cetera, but then stated, that students can use the same PE materials. Yes, and we have a very detailed plan that will involve how we're going to sanitize those uh, those uh, products or, or uh, pieces of equipment, balls or whatever they would be between classes. Uh, the difference of that is a teacher can gather all those together and sanitize, but individual pencils shared back and forth between students at their desks, uh, it's harder for us to control that. Next question, if a child is distance learning, will they get to do sports and band? The answer to that is yes. As long as they meet the same eligibility criteria as every other student, as the students who are in session. So attendance, involvement, doing the assignments on the distance learning, yes, they can participate. They will not be refused participation. Is there a possibility way for schools such as Jim Hill to make it so teachers change classroom versus <coughs> um, and the students, um, it's secondary, that becomes more and more difficult. I know we're looking at exploring that right now and different options um, to make that happen. But um, the layout of Jim Hill, which was built as a, a junior high, not as necessarily as a middle school, uh, it might be a little more difficult, but we are exploring options uh, and we'll do that if at all possible. Uh, okay, can you start? Uh, your child in school in person uh, and then move to distance learning and the answer to that is yes and again we're asking on that distance learning for a nine-week commitment so if you start out in distance learning we're going to ask that you you follow that commitment until the end of the nine weeks and if you want to continue in distance learning that's awesome but we might change that around a little bit and uh, do that uh, just a, a little bit differently 
Um, more questions that came in. Um, be, will parents be able to eat lunch with a child? And the answer to that is no. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, and again, that is just a, a safety protocol. You, you can't wear a mask and eat at the same time. So at this time, we're saying no, that will not happen. Will busing uh, change at the elementary, middle school level on Minot Air Force Base? Um, and that will depend on a lot of different things. It could depend on cleaning. Uh, but please understand that Minot Air Force Base, that is a contract through the Department of Defense that is not Minot Public Schools. So um, we'll have a lot of discussion with the Yellowfin Bus Company on that. Um, and we're going to we're going to continue that work and discussion. So I really can't answer that one right now, but um, we will be discussing. I know what they said is as far as cleaning expectations are going to follow our recommendations. Um, so we'll just have to see um, how that will work. Uh, someone asked also, will my Magic City Campus continue a, a, a test exemption based on attendance? Um, and the answer to that is, uh, according to uh, Superintendent Slotsky in some discussion yesterday, the answer to that is no. Um, we can't have policies in there that would encourage kids to come to school sick. So uh, that that will not be in existence this year. Um, somebody asked, how will lunch work? My child in school is a small cafeteria. Will they be eating in the classroom? Possibly. One of the things we've looked at, again, depending on the physical plant, is um, maybe one day a class eats um, lunch in their classroom. The next day they might be outside. Third day they'd be in the cafeteria. Um, I think through all of this, the idea is going to be uh, creativity is going to be key. And the advantage of all of this is that once we have teachers back on the 18th, we can really start digging into right-sizing this so we have a better idea um, of how this might be able to work in our particular um, school setting. So a lot of different uh, options coming. Um, if a student chooses distance learning for the first nine weeks, um, can they join their home school at the second quarter? Absolutely. Yeah, nine week at a time commitment. Uh, another person asked, how is this going to work with um, um, like large groups, band, phi ed? Uh, we're still working out that detail. I know that our middle school people had some pretty good ideas on what that might look like. Our music people did, and uh, we're looking at some of those options. There are some special masks that kids can wear, but most likely we'd be looking at bringing um, those big groups into larger areas uh, for their instruction. For example, could you bring your, um, would it be feasible to bring the band into the gymnasium uh, that hour to play or it spread out in the theater. So I think we can look at some different options. Uh, and I know our groups are um, right now. Okay. How will children return to in-person class um, if they are distance learning the first nine weeks and they announce or determine they want to come back, they will be assigned a teacher uh, in that classroom. Uh, will children in school be tested for COVID? We do not have the authority to test kids for COVID. Uh, that is a parent responsibility. Um, we've not had any mass testing done in our schools in summer school. We've had mass testings in our community. Um, I think at this stage of the game, we would not be testing kids for COVID. Uh, if there was an option for test to test kids for COVID, it would involve parent uh, response and permission. We would not have the authority uh, to do that on our own. Somebody asked what mass breaks are. Uh, what would a mass break look like and um, how do they, what do these look like while keeping kids safe? Uh, for example, um, you know, one of the things that I, I think of with a mass break could be and again, it, it really lends the idea of creativity. And this is just one thing I thought that everybody wears a mask in the classroom. The expectation is you have them on. Uh, if you're listening to learn, if the teacher is lecturing or going through a lesson, then maybe every other student would be able to take their mask off for a period of time. During independent work, the other group of kids could take their mask off. Um, you could look at some different opportunities like that. Mask breaks could be the 
obvious time at lunch at, at physical education class. A lot of different options that we can look at for mass breaks. And uh, we do have some people looking at a little more specific information uh, in regard to um, um, mass breaks and um, and what they could look like and specifically how often they're considered to be needed uh, for kids at specific age levels. Um, is the district office still locked down? How safe is it to send staff and students to school when the administration building is locked down? I, I'm, I just want to touch on that briefly. Um, the district office building was the only building in the district that was not locked down. We had total and complete unfettered access to this building every moment that we were open from 8 o'clock to 4.30 or 7.30 to 5 or uh, whatever that was. It was not necessarily specifically related to COVID. It was a time where we felt that we have buzz-in systems in our schools. We needed that here. We have a bank in this building. I mean, there is definite concerns here. We have people that come here sometimes for meetings. Sometimes they're not incredibly happy. Um, if our emphasis is on security, our emphasis is on security at this building. So that's not indicative of COVID and lockdown. It is indicative of this notion that we need this building to be more secure as well. Um, okay, other questions here. Uh, somebody says, as a staff member, I'm required to uh, quarantine several times throughout the year. Am I going to be able to apply for uh, federal COVID coverage more than once? Uh, and I visited with the HR department today about this, um, and we're, we're putting together a little more definitive guidance. The way that I understand is that you're allowed up to 10 days every 12 weeks. So depending on where that would fall, um, that would be like for a quarantine, for example. But uh, we'll get more definitive guidance on that and, and see where that is. I do want to remind people that, to my knowledge, that CARES Act and Lee that we're talking about only goes until the um, – it only goes until the end of December unless it is reauthorized by Congress, which my understanding is it very well may be. Um, <clears throat> um, at what point, somebody asked a question here and said, at what point do you consider it to be so bad that you have to move to online learning? And that really falls in that, that orange area where we're starting to see more and more community spread. And when, when I talk community spread, I'm, I'm referring to not being able to trace where you got it from. You know, like in many cases right now, COVID says I was at a wedding, I talked to so-and-so, I found out they had COVID, and then now I have symptoms and I have COVID. But um, when we talk community spread, that's when people get COVID and they have no idea where they got it. Did they get it off a pump handle at the gas station? Did they get it off a doorknob? Did they get it in a bathroom someplace? And those are all the numbers we look at. We look at infection rates. We look at community spread. We look at um, hospitalization. And all of that fits into the puzzle. And that, again, is not made wholly by minor public schools. That decision is going to be made uh, in conjunction with First District Health, who takes their lead from the North Dakota Department of Health, who takes their lead for the CDC. Um, all right. Um, what day will the distance planning be out? I'm hoping that that is out. We, we I talked with Superintendent Lawson. I'm hoping that it's out on Monday. Uh, we can have our meetings with principals and get that uh, wrapped away. Uh, will the school district uphold the mask policy as stringently as the dress code? And the, the answer to that is yes, depending on the color code uh, and what those expectations are uh, in there. Uh, will there be a daily questionnaire for parents to fill out in regard to their child's health? Um, we're asking parents to assess their child's health on a day-to-day -day basis, but not necessarily to submit that to the school. Those questions um, will be coming out and through your schools. It's just a very quick checklist. And actually, the things that you should be watching for and looking for are already existed uh, in, um, in the distance learning plan. Student says, can I take ceramics and driver's ed if I do distance learning? There will be specific options for you to take your classes. However, I'm going to warn you, not warn you, but let you know as a former driver's ed teacher, 
Um, it's really hard to do the behind the wheel if you're distance learning. Uh, but, you know, we might have some options and things to, to uh, work on. I, I don't want anyone to think that distance learning is, is a punishment. That's not at all what it is. If you feel that it's in your best interest to be distance learning uh, this year, then I would suggest that you um, that you take that option, and we'll help you get the most out of your education um, as as possible. So I, I thank you uh, for that question. It's a great question, uh, and we'll continue on. Another one said, our homecoming activities planned as normal, pep rally, coronation, dance. Um, really a tough thing to ans uh, answer right now. I, I don't imagine we're going to be having a big dance. Um, and again, that will all depend on the numbers and, and where our infection rates are in our communities. So right now we're in green. When I look at our, our um, um, when I look on um are green. I don't see where we're going to be having any big social events like that. Somebody asked about spectators at, at athletic events. You know, our initial thing is to make sure we have an opportunity for kids to participate. Uh, and we very possibly will have very limited access uh, to uh, spectators. That's just part of the uh, process on keeping this safe for everyone. Um, somebody asked if there was a cap on distance learning class sizes. First thing we need to do is to find out um, how many kids we are going to have off for distance learning, uh, and then we'll need to start doing this. We're not looking at overtaxing teachers, uh, but we, we do need to find out, first of all, where those numbers are, how many kids are we going to have in our seats, how many are we going to have online, and then we'll plan accordingly. <clears throat> when will classified staff learn what is expected of them? And again, a great question. We've got a lot of work coming. Um, we're going to have a lot of training opportunities in those days before school starts if the board approves our 27th start. Um, but we'll have more information coming. But one thing I can let all the classified staff know, paraprofessionals and, and on and on, is that you know your expectations or your job might not be the same as they were when everybody was traditionally in school. Uh, and we'll have opportunity uh, to to move that forward. Another question about nursing: Are we going to have more nursing time? We'll have the same amount of nursing time. You know, currently, you know, it just is now they're split uh, between our schools, and we'll do the best to spread them out. But also understand, a school nurse is not going to be able to give you a diagnosis of COVID or anything like that. But they have been very helpful in the process of us determining what we need to do uh, to keep everyone's a state safe. Um, somebody asked, uh, music or said the music plan is vague. Will children be singing, playing woodwind instruments? Um, again, those are things that need to be determined depending on where we're at. We are looking at some different masks that will allow, for example, a woodwind player to still play the instrument but cover um, the majority of the mouth and, and face. But again, those types of like playing an instrument and such might be have to be done outside. They might have to be done in um, a larger uh, area. We'll have to weigh that out and, and get working on that uh, quickly. Uh, that is the end of my questions. Uh, I just, uh, I keep thinking on many, many, many days since March 15th, listening to Governor Burgum and one day having the opportunity to be a part of his press conference and he either always begins or ends with gratitude. And the gratitude I want to share today is, is twofold. First, to the members of the committee that, that have worked very, very hard and have gathered input from many different sources and have tried diligently to build a plan that they believe is the best plan that we can put together at this time, knowing that it's not going to make everybody happy. And uh, I keep thinking back on Teddy Roosevelt's, um, you know, talk about being the man in the arena. And uh, these folks were in the arena and they were fighting it out. And uh, thank you for your dedication and hard work and hours of long meetings and research. I, I appreciate uh, everything that you've done. The rest is for the, all of the parents and teachers and students that even in short order last spring with very little planning opportunity, we're able to string together um, I think a pretty successful 
um, learning opportunity for kids. Uh, and while it may not have been perfect and we're working on enhancing that distance learning opportunity now, uh, in short order, we went from being in school, going to spring break, to finding out the following Sunday that we weren't allowed to come back to school. And, and that wasn't an easy pill to swallow, but people rallied uh, and they really did great work. So I want to thank everybody that had a role in that, parents, kids, teachers, uh, our support staff. You make a difference uh, each and every day. So um, again, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll be putting together a Q&A as soon as we can. Uh, get this out to you. Again, our goal always uh, is to be here and answer questions that you may have. Uh, and I thank you for your time.